Good evening to our Wings family. I hope that you've had a good week. I hope that God has been with you. I know that God has been with you. And I hope that you have felt his presence in your life. Last couple of days, I've been listening to a new song that reinforces that idea that through all that we face in life, good and bad, there's Jesus. Amen. Sometimes we don't always acknowledge it. Sometimes we don't always believe it. But there is Jesus always. So, Lord, we take that into mind tonight as we open our service with worship, that you are always there for us, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our Savior that never forgets us, never forsakes us. Thank you, Lord, for having us at the top of your list, so to speak, and for caring enough for us to watch over us and to know us better than we know ourselves, Lord. There is none like you. You deserve the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There is none like him. That's what our first song talks about. Stand up and give him the praise. Who is like the Lord? There is no one who is like the Lord. He is strong and mighty. Who is like the Lord? He is worthy. Stand up and give him the praise who is like the Lord there is no one who is like the Lord he is strong and mighty who is like the Lord he is worthy stand up and give him the praise praise the Lord praise the Lord our God is worthy of glory from the rising of the sun till it's going down, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Stand up and praise him and give him the glory. Stand up and praise him and give him the glory. Stand up and praise him and give him the glory. Our God is worthy of our praise. Who is like the Lord? Oh, there is no one who is like the Lord. He is strong and mighty. Who is like the Lord? He is worthy. Stand up and give him the praise. Who is like the Lord? Oh, there is no one who is like the Lord. He is strong and mighty. Who is like the Lord? He is worthy. Stand up and give him the praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our God is worthy of glory. From the rising of the sun till it's going down, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Stand up and praise him and give him the glory stand up and praise him and give him the glory stand up and praise him and give him the glory our God is worthy of our praise let's stand up and praise him and give him the glory stand up and praise him and give him the glory stand up and praise him and give him the glory our god is worthy of our praise who is like the lord amen there is none like him thank you father for your mercy and your blessings god for opening our eyes to all that you have for us god that is our prayer tonight, God, that you would take us, God, and open our eyes to see exactly who you are, God. Hallelujah. This is a song that you know you're familiar with, but tonight I want you to make it your prayer. Sing it directly to our Savior tonight. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing that again. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up, shine in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, 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 to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 you are holy. of my heart I want to see you I want to see you open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you 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 I want to see you. I want to see you. That's our prayer tonight, God, that you would open our eyes and our hearts, God, to fully accept who you are, God, and what you have for us, Father. Lord, you've always been there for us, God. those good times when we rejoiced and certainly in the bad times when we doubted who you were and may not even have thought of you. You were there loving us all along, Father. Thank you for that. Hallelujah. Thank him for his assurance and his promise tonight. loves you and me oh how he loves you and me
to you. Aren't you thankful for God's keeping power? Amen. I want to just express again my heartfelt appreciation to all of our Wings family, friends that have joined with us financially during these very challenging times. I know that many of you are facing situations in your own personal life that you just aren't sure of where your next paycheck is going to come from, some that have lost employment, some whose jobs are on the line, so to speak, but God's people have been faithful, and um, I'm blessed to sit here as your pastor, continuing in this live stream as I hear from so many others. And God's people are rising up during these times. And um, I just appreciate again your faithfulness and support to our church's ministries. We're not going down. The church is not alive, or it's not dead. The church is alive. We're not here just to survive, but thrive. That's been the theme that's been in my heart since the beginning of this pandemic. I stand in that. I believe greater things are coming out of this than we would ever begin to guess. God is doing great things, and we're so, so very thankful. So again, thank you for your faithfulness and giving. You can continue your giving through uh, mailing tithe and offerings to the church at 5066 Southeast 64th Avenue Road, Ocala, Florida, 34472. You may also go to our website, wingsoffaith.com. You may also, if you've not done so yet, download our church app in the app store. Just look for Wings Ocala. And you can download our app and you can give through our church app. I encourage you to continue to download our church app if you've not done so yet just so that you can keep up with the uh, different ministries, calendars, and uh, different things related to the church and its, and its ministries here. Also just want to take a moment and encourage you, if you're watching this by Facebook, please be sure to share this. Maybe you'll start a, a watch party, but uh, share this with your friends, your family. You have no idea who will pick this up, who will listen in on this broadcast not only tonight, but in the coming days. Who knows whose life may be challenged or changed for the glory of God. So again, we just thank you. I want to go to the Lord in prayer for just a few moments before we enter our, our Bible study tonight. I'm sure there are many needs. I've read of different ones who have lost loved ones relating to this virus. And um, different families are grieving. Families across this, not just our nation, but around the world that are grieving because of the lost loved ones as a result of this virus. Others who have lost family members due to other circumstances. Our hearts go out to you, our prayers we now offer on your behalf. Those who are struggling again with their job and employment situations, we want to pray for you as well. So Father, I just thank you. Thank you for this opportunity tonight. We join together in hearts, Lord, across literally not just Ocala, 
not just the state of Florida, but literally, Lord, around the world. We join our hearts together. We pray we are so very grateful, oh God, that we serve a great and mighty God, a God that we can call on in our times of trouble, a God that we know that hears and answers prayer. Oh God, we're so thankful that you are our Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. I thank you that you are our Jehovah Rohi, our God who sees. I thank you, oh God, that you are our El Shaddai, our God who is more than enough. Whatever we face, oh God, you are more than enough to take care of us in our time of need. Physically, Lord, we declare healing. Financially, Lord, we declare provision. For you are our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Lord, you've proven yourself again and again and again. Lord, perhaps there's a young believer. Perhaps this is the very first challenging time in life that they've had. And Lord, they're having to lean on you and depend on you. Oh God, I thank you that you're going to prove yourself faithful. Just as you have in my life, just as you have in the lives of so many others. Lord, you prove yourself faithful time and time and time again. Lord, we are so very grateful. We thank you, O oh God, that you are our great shepherd and overseer of our souls. We thank you, O oh God, that you never lead us to pastures that are dry and barren, but, oh God, you lead us to green pastures. You are our great shepherd. Lord, we thank you that you don't lead us to raging rivers that, and storms that are challenging to us or that bring fear in our lives. But Lord, you lead us to still waters, deep waters. Lord, you reveal yourself to us as deep calls unto deep. Lord, we're so thankful for that tonight. Lord, I just pray encouragement. I pray a stirring, Lord, in the heart and life and spirit of every person watching this broadcast. That, Lord, that you'll just stir their hearts. Lift them, O oh God. Strengthen their minds. Strengthen their spirits. And help us, Lord, to be the people that you'd have us to be. Lord, we thank you for it. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Again, I, I welcome you tonight to our worship and the word. Pastor Kevin, again, thank you so much for that wonderful time of worship. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a, a subject uh, for the next little while. I hope that you have a Bible and can follow along uh, with me as we enter uh, this, um, this study tonight. I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight about the battle of our minds. The battle of our minds. If you have your Bible, I'd like to just uh, read this scripture as our main text here, found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But you know, I'm always forgetting something. Forgot my glasses tonight, so let me get this in the light and at hand, arm's length, so I can read it. And um, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Let's back up to verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought. Let me repeat that for just a moment. You might want to repeat this or, or declare this out loud. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So our subject tonight is the battle of our minds. The battle of our minds. We were working here in the church yesterday. We've been remodeling and painting and doing things that we can do inside our facility while we're not allowed to have services. 
as of yet. And a young man that's been working with us that lives in our community that comes by the church often came by and was wanting to help us a little bit. And, and so he was, and we were, we were with him. And, and he said to me, he said, Pastor, I really need you to pray for me. And uh, a couple of the other men were here, and we sat down right here in the sanctuary, and, and um, we began to pray over this young man. And, and uh, he said, I need for you to pray for me in my mind. My mind is not right. And um, we began to pray for him in his mind. And then myself and these other brothers in Christ that are older and mature believers in the Lord, we all spoke into his life about this truth, this reality, that the battle is won and fought in our minds. Satan attacks us in our minds. I promise you today, every day, I talked to you last week about discerning between the spirit and the flesh, not being ruled by our flesh, but discerning by our spirit and walking and living by the spirit. Well, another way that we get attacked in the spirit, again, is in our minds. The scripture tells us that Jesus, this is Paul writing Colossians 2 and 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. See, the truth is, we're in a real battle. The battle is real. Don't take that away from anybody. The battle is real. The battle in your mind and my mind is a real battle. We battle against Satan in the demonic realm. It's a real battle that is filled with lies and schemes and deceptions at every turn. And we need to understand that. God wants us to remember the truth of his word. We need to know the word. We need to have God's word hidden in my heart. What the psalmist said, the psalmist said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word is truth. God's word is alive. God's word divides between the truth and a lie. And so we want to take God at his word. God's word is armor for us. God's word helps to establish us in our minds and, and keeps us focused on those things that are most important for us. The first thing we need to remember tonight is that Satan is a great deceiver. In fact, Jesus said that Satan is a liar and not just a liar, but the father of lies. So that whenever a lie uh, is brought to you or you're confronted by a lie, Remember that that lie originates with Satan. One of the first schemes or lies that the enemy wants you somehow to believe is that the devil or Satan has the same kind of power that God has. But Satan is not like God. Satan and God are not co-equal, one being good, the other being evil. Satan is a created being, created just like you and I. Now, he may have more power than you and I because he was created. He's been around a lot, whole lot longer than us. We live 70, 80, 90. Maybe we get to 100 years of age. Uh, most of the time, if we get to 100 years of age, we're not really wanting to be here because our bodies are breaking down. Physically, but in truth, Satan has been around for thousands of years. Remember, he was with Adam and Eve in the garden. Remember what he did with Eve in the garden? He deceived her. He spoke a lie to her. Eve believed the lie, and consequently, death came to her. Sin came as a result of that. And so Satan has been around a long time. But just because he's been around a long time doesn't change the fact that Satan is and was created by God. He is not like God. How is he not like God? 
Number one, Satan can only be in one place at one time. What is God? God is omnipresent. What does that mean? That means that he's everywhere at once. There's never a place that God is not. The psalmist said it like this. If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the depths of the earth, you're there. There's literally nowhere that you and I can go where the presence of God is not. He is everywhere. He is omnipresent. But Satan is not like God. Satan is, can only be in one place at one time. In fact, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 exactly where Satan is. The Bible says that Satan is before the throne of God bringing accusations against the brothers. That means he's bringing accusations against you and against me. And so Satan is not like God in the fact that he can only be in one place at, at one time. How else is he not like God? He's not like God in the fact that he does not know everything. God is omniscient. Omniscient. It means God knows all things. The Bible's very clear. God knows your thought before you think it. God knows the word before you speak it. God knows what you're going to do before you do it. God knows all things. He knows all things past. He knows all things present. He knows all things to come. God is omniscient. You can't fool God. That's the reason why there's... It's, there's no reason for you to try to lie or deceive because God knows it all. I think it's quite funny as we read the scripture. How many different times people have tried to deceive God? Not fully understand that God knows all things. So for you and I today as believers, that's one of the great things that we need to know and understand. You might as well just be real with God. You might as well just be honest with God. Because he knows everything anyways. You cannot fool him. But Satan does not know everything. Satan does not know the future. Believe me when I say this. Satan does not know what's going to happen tomorrow. You say, well, wait a minute. What about all of this scheming and whatever's going on? Oh, Satan can have his plans. But guess who can disrupt Satan's plans? God. God can disrupt Satan's schemes at any point in time. Why is it important for you and I to pray? It's important for you and I to pray so that Satan's schemes can be disrupted. Satan doesn't know what's going to happen next week or next year. Only God knows. Now, God reveals himself sometimes in dreams. God also reveals himself through his prophets. In fact, the scripture says he, God does not do anything except that he reveals it to the prophets first. That's the reason why the prophetic voice is so important for us. It was important for us in the Old Testament. Remember the prophets in the Old Testament? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, major prophets, minor prophets, Daniel, Amos, Hosea, Jonah, Zechariah, Zephaniah. You know, all these minor prophets, the reason why they're called minor prophets, because their uh, prophecies were smaller in content. Major prophets had much lengthier prophecies that extended over larger periods of time. But whether they were a major prophet or a minor prophet, the truth is God spoke to them. They wrote it declaring what was going to happen in the future because only God knows what the future holds. Satan does not. Satan does, first of all, again, he's not like God in that he's not everywhere at once. He can only be in one place. He's not like God in that God is omniscient. He knows all things. But Satan is also not like God in the fact that um, he is not all powerful. Satan's strongholds in your life can be broken by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Word of God. It does not matter what stronghold that you may be bound by. The truth is God's Word and God's Spirit is stronger. And we do not have to fear the devil. Now, it doesn't mean that we run around treating the devil like he's a, a kindergartner or a child. No, because... 
Yes, he is powerful in the fact that he's strong and is scheming. He's been around a long time. And so there are things that he has worked himself into that, that make him a very powerful force. But he is not God and he is not like God. So let's just establish that. Satan is not God and he's not like God. First and foremost. We're talking about the battle of our mind. So how does Satan work? Satan puts thoughts into our mind. He puts thoughts in our mind sometimes through people. Have you ever had anybody speak a discouraging word to you? Have you ever had anybody speak death instead of life to you? Not always, but oftentimes that's a result of Satan's schemings. For, for Satan or the devil to use someone to speak negatively into your life to tell you you're not going to make it. You're going to fail. You're going to die. You might as well just give up. You might as well just quit now. Quit while you're ahead, so to speak. And Satan lying, deceiving, and using people or using circumstances. Maybe you gave your best effort at something and you failed all by yourself. I don't know about you, but I have failed at times in life. And I have not had anybody to blame except myself. And that, the devil come whispering in your ear. You're just no good. You're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to be able to accomplish anything. Again, you might as well just quit. You see, the devil wants you somehow to believe a lie and be damned instead of believe the truth and be lifted up and glorify to the point where you glorify uh, the Lord. The Bible says that the Spirit clearly says in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. We don't want to do that. We want to believe what God says. There's so many different scriptural uh, examples. How about this one? Found in Acts chapter 5. When Peter said to Ananias, Acts chapter 5 verse 31, he said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? And have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Now, if you remember the story about Ananias and Sapphira, they had sold a piece of land. And they deceptively brought a part of the price of that land and gave it to the apostles under the pretense that they were giving them all the money for the land that they had sold. And so Peter chastised Ananias. In the scriptures, if you go back and read that story, Peter chastised him and said, Ananias, it was your land. All the money that you sold the land for was yours. You could have done anything that you wanted with it. But how is it that you deceived God in wanting to make God think that somehow you're giving him everything when in truth you are not? So we have to be very, very careful. It's not just what we do with our life, but it's how our lives impact and affect others. So Peter chastised Ananias. The Bible says that Ananias fell dead. They carried him out. Then his wife came in a little bit later and Peter questioned her. Hey, is this the price that you got for the land? Yeah, that's the price we got for the land. And then Peter had to rebuke her and say, hey, because you lied the same way your husband lied, those that carried your husband out, they're coming in to carry you out too. You know what happened as a result of that great fear came on the church. And people in that moment came to realize, you know what, the last person I want to lie to is God. 
But Satan wants to trick you into thinking that you can lie your way through life. Satan comes and he tempts us with accusations and he tempts us with deceptions. He'll tempt you to look away from God. He'll tempt you to rely on yourself instead, yourself instead of relying on God. He'll accuse you because he's the accuser of the brethren. Listen, we don't want to go around as believers accusing one another. We want to do what Paul said in Galatians 6, 1 and 2, where if we see someone, a brother or sister in Christ that stumbles, then we want to be mature enough to lift them up and encourage them. Amen? Amen. I'm sorry. I'm used to speaking to a live audience. I don't have you there responding amens to me, so. Oh, I got a couple of amens in the, in the audience. <laughs> so, Satan will tell you lies. He'll attempt to get you to um, believe them, scheming. And then, you know, sometimes in the battle of our minds, Instead of trying to deal with the devil when he comes and, and tells a lie to us, we'll just try, instead of dealing with it, we'll just try to ignore it. We don't want to ignore it. We want to, we want to cast it out. We want to take that captive. Bring obedience to Christ means simply that, you know what, how does that line up with God's word? Is that truth true by God's word or is that a lie? Okay, that's, that's not true. God's word doesn't say that. Therefore, it's a lie from the devil. Okay, therefore, I refuse to believe it. And I get rid of it, and I don't think about it any longer. Pure and simple. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But when those accusations come, we take hold of it, and we get rid of it. There's another principle. That is, if we're not very careful, we give the devil a, a foothold in our life. In Ephesians 4, 26-27, Reveals to us and declares, which says that if, if we don't deal with anger quickly, we give the devil a foothold in our life. The last thing you want to do is give the devil a foothold. It's just like opening the door a little bit. He gets his foot stuck in the door, and then you can't get that door shut again. So don't even open it to those lies, to those deceptions. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, 11. Anyone you forgive, I forgive. What I've forgiven, if there's anything to forgive, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not aware, unaware of his schemes. One of the greatest schemes of the devil is to get us to live and walk in unforgiveness. But Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 14, if we don't forgive men their sins against us, then our Heavenly Father cannot forgive us of our sins. So one of those schemes from the devil to get us to believe the lie, to get us to the point of um, being unwilling to forgive. So we have to take control of that battle of our minds. I want to talk to you for just a moment about the relationship between demons and Christians. The relationship between demons and, and Christians. As a believer, as a Christian, you cannot be demon-possessed. Okay, the Holy Spirit and the devil are not going to live in the same house. The Holy Spirit is clean, righteous, pure. The devil is anything but clean, righteous, and pure. So the devil and the Holy Spirit are not going to live in, live in the same temple. So if you've invited Christ in your life, the Holy Spirit of God is living inside of you. Therefore, you are not demon-possessed. All right? Now, is your mind, are you battling demonic thoughts, lies, schemes of the devil? Yes, you do. Yes, I do. But again, we choose to take that captive. I want to talk to you for just a moment. There is a real thing. Some people try to discard this. Evil is real. The devil is real. The demonic realm is real. Yes. But again, we as believers, with God living in us, we don't have to be afraid. 
The power of Christ in us as a believer is stronger than any power of the devil. Years ago, as a young pastor, when I went to Utah to pastor, Utah was a very, very strong and still is a very strong, demonic, uh, just stronghold, strong demonic presence in the state of Utah. If you've not lived there, you have no comprehension. But believe me when I say that a spirit of deception is very, very strong throughout what is known as Mormondom from Idaho, northern Idaho, straight down through Utah, down into northern Arizona. And um, we were ministering there in, in Utah, and the Lord's blessing, the church is growing, people were being saved. We had just a massive revival, more than 100 people saved in the first six months, first time conversions to Christianity. The first six months we went there to pastor, God just Open the heavens, blessed in a mighty way. Well, it was about probably about a year and a half into our pastor. So I was still a young pastor. I wasn't even 30 years of age yet. And um, one night, our singles group, uh, which was largely made up of older singles, not like young college age singles, but um, career age singles, they were meeting at one of our single ladies' homes. They're in a backyard cookout. There's probably about 30 or so singles in the group. And I live just a few blocks away. And it's Friday night, and, and the person that was conducting the, um, the gathering, the small group, called me in a panic. Pastor, pastor, you've got to come right now. We have this lady that showed up tonight, and she's manifesting demons, and she's running around my backyard on all fours and barking like a dog and just acting like an animal. Pastor, you got to come right now. And uh, so I personally had never experienced somebody that was completely, totally possessed by the devil. And so it was a new experience for me too, but I was not afraid. It's not afraid because I knew that God in me is greater than, than he that's in the world. And so I went over and in my naivety, I chased this woman around that backyard until I tackled her. <laughs> like a defensive football back that I was for many years. I tackled her, wrestled her to the ground. Two or three of us grabbed her, manhandled her, literally physically restraining her from injuring herself. Loaded her into a minivan, drove down to the church, brought her in the sanctuary, started praying over her, about three or four of us, and we prayed all night long. We cast every devil. We pray this in Jesus' name. We declared this. We spoke in tongues. We screamed. We hollered. We prayed until we were completely, totally exhausted. About 6 o'clock in the morning, we all went home. We thought everything was good. And um, the uh, lady went home, said she was good. Said she had received Christ, although I think it was a lie at that point because of other things that had happened. But this was, this was a real situation. So we came to church Sunday morning. I was tired from having an all-night, you know, prayer gathering on Friday night. But I come into church on Sunday morning. I preach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and I'm just declaring the word of the Lord. And we have an altar service, a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. And the altar's filled up, and this lady came forward for prayer again, and I prayed for her, and she hit the floor, went down under the power of God, and when she hit the floor, she started manifesting demons again. Started slithering all over the sanctuary, front of the sanctuary like a snake, and, and spewing stuff out of her mouth and all kinds of grotesque things. And so I ushered everybody out of the sanctuary, leave, you know, unless you want to stay here and pray with us through. So we stayed, and we prayed for hours. We, again, we came against every devil. We did this, we did that. We declared this, declared that, and prayed until we were fully, completely exhausted. Sent her home, thought everything was good. Till Wednesday night showed up. She came to Bible study Wednesday night. And um, Wednesday night, we'd finished Bible study. 
And um, I had stepped out of the room where I was teaching, stepped down in the hallway and was just visiting with some folks, fellowshipping. All of a sudden, I hear this scream, Pastor, get in here. I go running in to find this young woman. Just breaks your heart to see the destructive power of the enemy. This woman had run across the room, still demonized, punched her hand through a glass window, grabbed a shard of glass and began to slash herself. Blood going everywhere. We grabbed her, physically restrained her again, wrestled the glass shard out of her hand, began to pray over her one more time. By this time, I was beginning to understand some things. And um, the Lord helped me. The Lord had been dealing with me over a number of days about this situation, handling this situation. And instead of getting all hot and bothered and praying for hours on end and demanding this and declaring that, you know what? The devil was just, he was having a circus with us. He was just turning this into a big charade. He was turning this and using this young woman who was very, very traumatized by life. This young woman began to be sexually abused at the age of five. Her father sold her in prostitution from age five. She ran away from home at age 15, became addicted to all manner of drugs and supported her drug habit by prostituting herself. She ended up going to prison because of her drug addictions and stealing, trying to support her habit. This in my lifetime was the most abused human being that I've ever met in my life. Your heart just breaks for people like this. The devil so traumatized that girl that, yes, it took a lot of prayer on our behalf, but eventually we had to get to the point where we understood the devil was just using her to gain sympathy, to gain glory, to be glorified in the situation, to demonstrate his power. So on this final night, I just told everybody, I said, you know what, just stop. The Lord had been dealing with me about some things. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I didn't scream. I didn't holler. I didn't speak in tongues. I just said, in the name of Jesus, devil, you cannot stay. I called the girl by name. She had, at that point, multiple split personalities that I just believe were demons. One demon would come up and Declare a name and then go into hiding. Another demon would come out, declare a name, go into hiding. Another demon come out, declare a name, go into hiding. And every time a different personality or demon would come out and declare a name, I would just say in Jesus' name, I'm not talking to you. Shut up, go away. I want to talk to so-and-so. And And I call the girl's name. And very calmly I said, do you believe that Jesus died for you. Do you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, she did. We went through the sinner's prayer one more time. And I said, in Jesus' name, by the faith that you've expressed, confessing your sins to Christ, then God has saved you. The Spirit of Christ has come in your heart. And you will no longer be traumatized by the devil in this way. And you know what? Didn't take big fanfare. Didn't take praying all night for hours. Didn't take screaming and yelling and speaking in tongues. It just took the authority of Christ and me as a believer and the truth of God's word against any deceptive power of the enemy to see this young woman set free. I continued to serve as her pastor for a few more years. Every Sunday, this young lady would come with her children. She met a young man. They got married, and her family would come and sit on the front row of our church and worship God, hands raised, worshiping the Lord, tears streaming down her face, just in love with Jesus. 
I'm telling you, yes, there is a battle. There's a battle in our minds. Yes, the devil is real. But we need to understand our position in Christ. Christ in you is the hope of glory. The power of God in you is greater than any power of the devil. God is your defense. He is your refuge. He is your ever-present help in times of trouble. You don't have to fear any, anything the devil brings your way. We can stand in faith. We do not have to be frightened. We can stand in the power of Christ. The real danger comes for us as believers when we begin to entertain, entertain the lie of the devil that somehow God is not strong enough to help us. That somehow the power of God is not strong enough to break every addiction in our life, any stronghold, any bondage. The moment you begin to believe that lie, then you've lost the battle of your mind. And in that, then Satan then begins to be glorified. I also remember back in those early days, the early 1990s through the mid-1990s, if you've been a believer and been around for a long time, you'll remember there's, you know, there's a big phase that Christianity was going through back during that time. And um, really... The Spirit of God was moving a lot of nations around the earth and, and a lot of demonic strongholds were being broken. And um, there was a lot of things being, being declared. And, um, you know, sometimes I think there was, there was some abuse that began to take place. But one of the things that I began to realize as a pastor, you know, we'd, we would talk about the devil, going to tear the devil's kingdom down and so forth and so on. I remember that was one of the big... Worship course, I'm going up to high places, tear the devil's kingdom down. Not that there was anything wrong with tearing the devil's kingdom down. Not that there was anything wrong with going to the high places. But the reality is one day the Lord just kind of nudged me, didn't rebuke me strongly because I think my heart was in the right place. But just gently said, you know what? You need to stop glorifying the devil. Stop talking about the devil. Stop singing about the devil. Stop glorifying the devil. Just bring praise and adoration and glory to me, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We just began to change our, our worship experience and the songs we would sing would not talk about the battle anymore. We don't need to talk about that. We need to just walk it out, live it out, declare it, stand on it. And then in our worship, just bring our worship and our love and our praise to the Lord. God wants you and I to stand firm in Him and win the battle in our minds. How does that happen? It happens when we allow God just to turn the light on. Let God flip the switch for you. Let Him turn the light on in your life. Let Him shine brightly into every area, every corner of your life. If there's anything in your life that's not fully given over to the Lord, do that tonight. Just say, Lord, look at me. I'm fully exposed before you. Again, there's nothing we can hide before him. You remember Adam and Eve as I, as I close this? You remember Adam and Eve in the garden when they, when they sinned? And um, they believed the devil's lie. They ate the fruit that God told them not to eat. But then God comes back. He's looking for fellowship. And he says, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. But Adam and Eve were hiding. They were playing this game of hide and seek with God. They were hiding. God said, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, we were hiding because we were naked and afraid. God says, well, how did you know you were naked? Why are you afraid? Did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat? And of course, you know the story. And God took fig leaves and sewed them together and covered their nakedness, covered their shame. You know what? God still provides covering for us today. 
His covering for our shame is Jesus. His covering for us, he takes a robe of righteousness and wraps us in it. Says, I don't see you for who you are. I see you through who Christ made you to be. And I'm so, so very thankful for that. So we can be exposed. Let God turn his light on us and expose anything in our life that is not fully, completely given over to him and repented of before him. Amen. Join with me in prayer as we close. Lord, I just pray for every person tonight. Pray for every person, Lord, that in the coming days may hear this broadcast tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we can have in Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you can help us to overcome and win the battle of our mind. Thank you, God, we do not have to believe the lies and the schemes of the devil. Lord, we can stand firm in our faith, as Isaiah declared. If we don't stand firm in our faith, we won't stand at all. But we can, Lord, by your help, by your grace. You can help us to do that. Now I want to challenge if there's anyone that's listening to this broadcast, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, please accept Him today. It's as easy as ABC. A, we admit that we have sinned. B, we believe that Jesus is the only one that can forgive us of our sins. And C, we confess our sins to God. The ABCs of salvation. A, admit, B, believe, C, confess. If you'll do that, the Bible says that you can be saved. You will be saved. Let us know. Write a comment to us. If you have a prayer need you'd like for us to join with you in prayer about, just share it in a comment to us. We'll be sure to read those and pray over those. God bless you. We love you in the Lord. Have a wonderful night. God bless you.